What's it say? It says we're live. <laughs> it says live, yes. We Good live. morning. What's going on, everybody? Good afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. Uh, it is morning still where we are. There we go. We have different heights, you know, <laughs> so whether we're sitting or we're standing, things are always adjusting a little bit. So hope you guys are doing great. Um, as you can see in the, in the um, title of this video, every Tuesday is Drew's Day. <laughs> Except for when the Tuesday falls on my birthday. What is your birthday? So, <laughs> so we're Happy celebrating. Happy birthday, Risha. Thank you. <laughs> so we're celebrating today. Um, you guys and can sing along at home. <laughs> it probably would be awkward if I sing happy birthday to my wife, like to her in front of you guys. Not that I'm saying I wouldn't do it. This might seem weird. You guys will be sitting there live like this fast forward, but no, I'm just <laughs> We are excited that it's Reese's birthday today. Yeah. And uh, it usually falls right on Mother's Day. So a happy belated uh, Mother's Day to all of you out there as far as if you're a mom or if yeah. you have a mom. And I think that's all of us. So hopefully you got to celebrate your mom in your own uh, unique and special way. Mm -hmm. uh, so just like that, it is Tuesday. And we are back at it for another episode of Black with Ninjas live here mm -hmm. in our Facebook group. And um, if you're joining this for the first time, we just try and kind of come off the top, meaning uh, freestyle, just, you know, not really any kind of planned agenda, but uh, it's our opportunity to provide additional value to you guys. Uh, a lot of you have uh, something in common, your investors, your business owners, um, you believe in the power of automation, uh, you're smart investors because you've, you've understood uh, the value in being able to make your life easier by putting processes in place and bringing the right people in around your team uh, to help you accelerate your success. And so um, we're thankful to have been a part of that in any form or fashion, uh, even on the automation side. But I was just talking to Risha the other day. I said, you know, sometimes it's tricky because I feel like the value we have that we want to share with people is so much beyond, you know, just the technology, even though the technology um, and the awesome Aria Blackwood that we all use is what kind of brings us all together is that common thread. But um, in a lot of instances, there's more that we want to share and we'll try and keep everything relevant. But obviously it spills over in other categories as I imagine you guys have uh, interests, hobbies, and things of, of value that you look to share uh, as you go about your everyday lives. <laughs> your everyday lives. <laughs> Who's doing lives every day? No. So anyway, I- I can publish it. <laughs> Slow down now. <laughs> okay, so actually I did think of, as you were saying that, some like thought popped in my head. So. I had a young person, she's 15, 16, ask me this week, um, will you show me uh, what it's like to run a business? Will you um, give me some insight on being a business owner? Mm -hmm. And I thought that was so cool because uh, she has some business people around her, uh, which probably helps, um, at least open the door to possibility uh, for being a business owner. And I've talked with her a number of times uh, in the past about it and why we're business owners. And so um, I want to get your feedback, but I also want to talk to you and maybe we can um, talk about some of the reasons why we all became business owners. What are the benefits? What are some of the um, downsides, what are, what does it mean to be a business owner? And it doesn't matter for the sake of this conversation, if it's real estate investing or owning um, any other kind of business, whether it's a brick and mortar or um, uh, network marketing, any type of business, right? So why did you become a business owner? Why are we business owners? What is the, the thing? So yeah. List them out. List all the reasons, Drew. Uh, <laughs> I totally yeah, just put them on off, the spot. The cuff, I totally right? just put them on the spot um, right now. Okay. I guess if I were to answer this, I would think about um, my background and what my experience uh, was like with business and getting started and what I always thought about businesses. Um, I guess I would say that I didn't have a super unique background from the standpoint of 
it's very common and that it was the go to school, get good grades, you can get a good job. Mm -hmm. um, I do remember at a certain point, there was uh, a time in high school when you start to recognize that, you know, groups are developing and then there's like the cool kids and then the not so cool kids. And it's like, what makes the cool kids cool? Is it because they get in trouble? Is it because they have, you know, their parents bought them cars? Is it because they got no curfew? You know, whatever it might be. Is it because they dress cool? Right. And I remember seeing that like, huh, all the cool kids seem to dress cooler than, <laughs> than I did at the time. And so I remember thinking, well, I want to go get the stuff that the cool kids were wearing. And uh, if anybody's approximately my age, you might remember some of those old school brands like Z Cavarici or uh, Merite and Francois Gibault. <laughs> They're like the I denim jean these. shorts. Cavarici's. I only know these from from you. I'm these, talking like I've 1990, right? We, heard of, we knew of Jenko. Okay, well, that, that falls <laughs> in the category. Boo and Jenko. But anyway, the point of it all was I remember that uh, when I wanted to get the clothes the cool kids were wearing, my parents were like, that stuff costs too much. You can get, you know, two or three of these shirts for the cost of that shirt. And I'm like, man, well, I want that shirt. What do I got to do to get it? And so I had to come up with the money. And so that's where I started to get creative. And my parents would use in financial incentives with my grades. Hey, you get straight A's, we'll give you 50 bucks. And in my mind, I'm like, school's already easy. So if I just pay attention and give a little bit more of myself, I get the 50 bucks and I can go get the, the cool kid outfit and then I'll be one of the cool kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so early on, I had this linkage to like status and there being like a financial tie to it. It's like, all right, if I just, you know, got to figure out how to get paid. And so it seemed to go well with the idea of if you go get the good grades, you'll get a good school education and get a good job. And I thought that was the answer to everything financial. If you do that, that was the, the path to success. And then I still remember being in my early 20s, just entering corporate America, and I asked a couple of the, you know, the gray beard guys, like, hey, what are your best tips for financial success? And they would all say about the same thing. It was like, invest as much as you possibly can into your 401k, and by the time you're 65, you'll be a millionaire. And they could even show me on paper, right? By 65, it'd be like 1 million and 100,000. <laughs> 1 million and 30,000. 1 million, 1 dollar. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, not even taking into account things like inflation, and, you know, mm -hmm. everything, right? But mathematically, it was logical enough that made sense. Mm -hmm. And so to fast forward, I remember being roughly a decade into my career, uh, not even, um, and started to have that feeling of like, wait, I'm not really growing and progressing financially the way I thought I could. And these raises come slow and they're small. They're like 3%. And they're like, you did a great job this year. You get 2.4%. And I'm like, what does it sound great? At last I heard inflation was 3%. So am I losing? And uh, it was it was kind of funny. There was one particular year where they had fiddled with our, the company I worked for, fiddled with the comp plan. So we used to get paid quarterly and they were saying, we're gonna get paid halfway through the year. And this is important because it's like, oh, so even though I didn't get that 90 day little kicker to the pay, I knew one was coming mid year. So I'm like, all right, I got this bonus coming and I'm antsy, right? So I remember actually saying, you know, I was try, tired of driving my Honda Accord. I wanted to feel more successful. So I'm gonna go get this BMW that I've been really wanting. And so I said, well, I got some, some little savings and I can get creative and, you know, pull some funds together and, and get the down payment on this car because I got the bonus coming on the back end. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, I didn't get the bonus. It's like, why didn't I get the bonus? They did everything. Oh, well, you missed the, the, the thing by, we changed the metric of the threshold you had to get to get any payout. It moved and you missed it by 1%. So your whole team got no bonus. I'm like, man, scam alert. I was, I was. PO'd, brokenhearted. I just emptied my savings account to buy a car. Real smart. I knew that much wasn't smart, but I was, you know, I was hedging my bets. I had the money coming on the, you know, mm -hmm. my checkings and my savings, you know mm -hmm. how it goes. And so at that point, I felt so frustrated and hot in the blood because it was like I was stuck. They weren't giving out raises that year because I think we were, um, you know, on the front end of this back in 07, 08. And so I was like, all right, you know, before you get all bent out of shape, be glad and thankful you got a job, right? But at the same time, my mind had been programmed to you always get these quarterly bonuses and now you get this half year bonus. So you get, you're guaranteed or entitled to this pay. And I was like, huh, okay, that was my mentality, right? Mm -hmm. And so the wake up call for me was, what do you do? You know, if it's eight, 10 grand or whatever didn't come in like you planned. So you don't have really any sort of plan to make extra money if your job's not giving you what you think you deserve. And the fact of the matter is, I was starting to count on bonus money as like part of my salaries. I got revealed what my actual salary was, which is less because I'd been spoiled by this fake 
income that was, you know, while the getting was good, it was, it was real. Right. But when the getting wasn't so good, it was gone. Yeah, gone yeah. So I was like, ah, I got to live off my paycheck. Ew, how am I going to survive? And uh, I was frustrated. And that's what led me down the path of looking for things. And so I started by watching the bobbleheads on TV. Uh, they were talking about the stock market, which was red hot in early 07, like summer 07, the stock market was on fire. And I remember buying stocks with no knowledge, just like pick one, I'll get the, I'll get Apple, I'll get Google because of the names I know, Nike, you know, anything you see on TV, you buy it. And everything I bought touched the turn to gold. Yeah. And it was like, wow, I'm a genius. I should have been doing this. And I think it was August 14th, 2007, when the Dow peaked. If you're a fact checker, pull that up on your, on your stat sheets. But anyway, the point was, I had been buying like the month before that. So little did I know, I'm thinking I'm winning. And I'm in for the biggest sled ride down you can imagine. I didn't know what a stop loss order was. I didn't know about puts as insurance. I didn't know how to hedge my bets and play the downside of the market. None of that stuff. I didn't get any of that education until after. And what does it have to do with business? Well, it starts with investing and trying to create more for yourself. When you create a business, we are creatures. That means we are creators, creators, creatures. So we're always Great trying yours. to we're try, always trying to cre create something. So if we can't create our own thing easily, we can look at how we can invest in something else that's been created, mm -hmm. right? Someone mm -hmm. else's system, someone else's business, and let that grow and help be the fuel to that fire. And then you can benefit, or you can build your own lemonade stand, right? And so that's what got me searching. And for me, believe it or not, I actually found my first business opportunity through network marketing, which I didn't know what it was. I didn't have background in it, but I was sold on the idea of one day we'll be talking to each other like this. I could see it back then and I had a chance to get paid off it. Plus, I got introduced to the idea of residual he's, income. He's talking about a video phone. That's yeah, really video phones there. existed 12 years ago. Yeah. And I, when I heard about them, I got all geeked out and you know, made the list of family and friends and went trying to, you know, market them to the world. Um, but believe it or not, I found a few people that caught the vision and they had some success with th those services and others. And then I got a taste of the residuals. Yeah. And it was like, wow, all of a sudden you, you get to a point where you think, how can I make my residuals make residuals? Because this is cool, but you know, how can I grow it faster? And you just really start to over time, expand your mind to what's possible. So it was like, I was getting a chance to see direct sales. Um, I had seen other people go down the franchise path. I knew that you could go build your own lemonade, you know, stand from scratch. So there are all of these different models that you could take on if you want to create your own means by which you control your own destiny and start to be your own basis for financial freedom. And when I realized it kind of came in this indirect path, it was just really rewarding because it's like, everybody's got to have a place to live. Mm -hmm. I've already bought a house and it just seemed to make a lot of sense. Plus it's what all the wealthy people do and success leaves clues. So why not tap into a proven thing that's been around and last to check, people always need a place to live as long as we're around. So recession proof, I don't know, but it seems like a good bet. <laughs> well, Plus we, leverage hey, and tax and, benefits. And we've been in, we started in the recession. We did. So yeah. to joke and say recession proof, I don't know, is not true. <coughs> um, you can make money in the recession with investing in real estate. We've done it. That's where we started. That's what we're um, very well versed at. Yeah. So um, I think that that was really cool. So what I took away from Drew's story is um, really wanting to take control of your finances and really being able to be the one in control of of your money and how much you make. And um, when you're working for somebody else, the sky is not the limit, the ceiling is the limit. Whereas mm -hmm. when you're working for yourself, then the sky becomes the limit, right? Yeah. So you have um, money, money control. And one thing that um, it's gonna mirror on Facebook so they can That's see cool. this. Okay, so one of the things that um, before I had even thought about the, the financial control, were we already investing in, yeah, we were already investing in real estate and T. Harv Ecker talked about, um, here's your money and tell me how much is, of your pie is commission only right? Versus salary. Salary is what you get paid to do by your employer. So a salesperson is generally going to be more commission driven than 
um, a cashier, let's say. So a cashier is salary. There's no opportunity for really those increases except for those yearly bonuses or those not even bonuses, but yearly increase, yearly raises, right? So just identify that to see how much, how high you can go to the sky. And the more commission only you are, or the more commission you are, the higher you can go. So when you own a business, you know, you become 100% commission. Yeah, that's a good point. So I like that a lot. Um, there was a lot of what you talked about. And then you talked also about residual income, which we'll go into, we can have a whole other conversation about what residual is versus passive, um, how you can create that. And then, um, so you talked about residual and then the different types of businesses. So we got introduced to this through network marketing and what does that look like? And um, how does that look like for pyramids and everything they say, right? <laughs> I mean, that's it's something to talk about. It's something to understand. Um, yeah, anybody who's out there network then, marketing, I can tell that whole story you know, separately. Active, <laughs> active income, right, through the network marketing. And then what do you do with your money when you have it? And then we put it in real estate. And then we realize that real estate is a better vehicle for us. Um, so for me, the reason I wanted to be a business owner and the reason that I got into this actually had very little to do with the money side of it. Um, I just, that just wasn't a concern for me. So for me, it was, um, it was, I didn't like people telling me what to do is what it comes down to. She's a rebel. <laughs> I am. I really, really have a hard time with um, rules that somebody else puts in place <laughs> and that I have to abide by. I really have a challenge with this. And so for me, I noticed that, and I'm really good at what I do, like whatever it is that I have done, I've been really good at it. And then when I'm not really good at, and it's because I don't want to learn it, then I just don't do it. And, and I don't say that to just like toot my own horn, right? It's, more so that I can learn anything. I've always had that confidence that like, if I want to do something, I can do it. And so when I got out of school, um, I had no idea what I was going to do. Like through school, all of a sudden I, ac I ended up with an accidental degree in <laughs> international Spanish. And it was so, I was like, well, I might as well move to Phoenix. I've been dating this guy for three years and I know Phoenix. Phoenix has a lot of Spanish speaking opportunities. Um, like, let me go down there and let me learn, or let me learn something. Let me figure something out. And I ended up just as an entry level job and I moved up that corporate ladder really, really fast. And I still noticed that every 18 months to two years, I was like, I need to do something else. And all the while I was telling Drew, like, I don't even remember when it started. It must've started in like 2010 where all of a sudden I was like I need to quit I need to quit I'm <laughs> yeah, do, I'm not doing not I'm not happy. doing what I meant to do but I was really good at it and I was going and I was climbing so that's where for me it's a more about control it's more about like freedom and control to be able to do what I want and to be able to serve this world and I found that ability by being a business owner and by being a real estate investor because I can invest in real estate. We can, we've learned how to wholesale properties. We've learned how to flip properties. We've learned how to invest in multiple different categories of real estate. Um, but at the end of the day, we've been able to identify what are our preferences, ones that give me the lifestyle I want, that give Drew the financial security and the financial riches that he was looking for when starting uh, real estate investing or starting becoming a business owner. Um, you know, and you get to figure out what it is that you want. So that's why I became a business owner. That's why I think that I'm here and I feel like, yep, I'm where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> I'm where I'm supposed to be. And the beautiful thing is we all enter this place where we, we have these varied backgrounds, yet we saw a common thread, a common promise that was out there that we could tap into. It's like, hey, I could be, uh, you know, lunch bucket Bob or, or, or uh, you know, white collar Jane, you know, that never wants to get her hands dirty. And you guys can look at the same investment and be able to participate in a vehicle that gives you lifestyle control. And that's what part of it gets to be more and more about. Because even when I looked at, at my journey into 
this whole world too. Again, if, if I admitted up front, like you were the rule following guy, anybody know about disc profiles? I was high C, right? Uh, very compliant. I was a rules follower. So I did the thing, right? I marched to the beat of the drum. Um, and then at you know, a certain point, you start to realize when the world's presenting you evidence that doesn't map to the story you've been told, it's like, what? I can't help but, but, but question. Like, I know I'm not crazy. I'm seeing something that's like mapping out to be nothing that's really going to get me where I want to go. And it was like, okay, you chose engineering. Shouldn't that mean that you're going to be rich in 10 years? Like, no, you, you got a good paying job. That just means, you know, you've got more disposable income, but you've also got higher expenses. So you've not really like shot away from the pack. You've not really taken control. And so then you get to learn, you know, as your income rises, now you're moving into higher tax brackets and you don't have write-offs and you're giving up more and more of your time in exchange for those dollars. And at a certain point, it's a fair trade. And then when you start to introduce like family or before you even get to family, a serious relationship, or maybe you don't want to be on the road all the time because you met a local, someone that really makes you want to spend uh, a couple of nights during the week for dinner, as opposed to being at the local, you know, holiday inn, you know, getting the happy hour special again. And you just realize there's things that you can control and massage and you don't have to opt into the plan of the masses. It is not saying their plans flawed. It's not saying you're flawed if you find yourself in that same rat race. But if you find yourself in life in any situation, it could be a relationship, it could be your job, it could be, you know, some other situation. You might be having spiritual unrest going on inside yeah. your body. It might be family conflict with the people around you, whatever. But when you know you've got some of that internal turmoil, ask the questions. Because yeah. it is a sacred cow to say, I am going to leave, you know, a six-figure job that I've been spending 15 years working to accumulate. Why would I abandon that? And it's like, well, think about it. What's worth more? Like, what is your experience you want to have on the life, right? At the end, to be bragging that you were paid more than anybody, but you didn't have happiness. Like, right. what kind of existence is that? And so I don't mean to get soapbox winded, no. but I'm just oh passionate goodness. about like everybody will find that point in which there's a spark. Yes. There's a, like the current vehicle yes. I am in is not delivering to me what I want to experience. Mm -hmm. And so I have no choice but to question either the validity of the vehicle or the direction it's going. And yes. what control do I have to change this? Because at the end of the day, the ultimate maturity is when you look at a situation in your life and ask yourself the question, what have I done to create this? What? Because the answer to that question, it says a lot. Because if a situation you're happy about, be proud. Pat your back self on the back. Celebrate. But if you found yourself in a bad scenario, understand, even if it's external circumstances, what role do we play in creating that situation? And better yet, once you find yourself you know, in that situation, what are you going to do to get yourself out of it? Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to tell a quick story, and then I want to see from you guys, if you guys got any input for us, because I'm, I'm feeling good, my blood's flowing through me. Um, I get old analogies, and I don't watch a lot of TV, but I used to watch a TV show. Um, it was a sci-fi sci <laughs> science fiction. It was called Quantum Leap. Look it up if you haven't heard about it. You may remember it. It was a cheesy show about a guy who was a scientist, and he experimented with time travel. And all I remember with the main thing is he would... Uh, Every episode, he would get zapped into a new place, and he might be in the 1800s and wake up in the middle of a war, and he has to like duck because they're, you know, stabbing each other with bayonets, and he has to get away and survive for 24 hours until he's teletransported somewhere else. And so it's funny that he would always find himself in these predicaments that he had no control over, yet he had to figure out a way for survival of nothing else. How do I get through this situation I'm in? And all he could use was his combined aggregate, compounded experience, knowledge, know-how, to use that to his advantage to navigate the waters, even when he didn't have a map, even when he didn't have the answers, even when he didn't know how he was going to deal with what was right in front of him. Mm -hmm. But he always found a way because he knew if he just kind of kept going, didn't quit, kept trying to figure it out, figure it out, he could at least survive long enough to um, hack the code to, to get away or to make it to the next adventure. And that'd be the next episode in the TV show. But don't we all have that experience like in our lives? You remember what it was like being a teenager. It was a chapter in your life. Remember when your two best friends were fighting or when your, your girlfriend broke up with you or when that, you, um, you know, someone. That... <laughs> I never had a girlfriend. You were the only one. But in those different 
lackluster chapters of our lives, <laughs> we found that there might have been situations that we had that some made us happy and some didn't make us happy. And certain ones that didn't make us happy, how did we deal with them, right? How did we change that situation? How did we endure it? Because at the end of the day, winter is only three months. It doesn't last forever unless you live a little further up north. Same with the summer. It's going to end. The seasons always yeah. change. But it requires either inspiration or desperation to change your situation. Awesome. I <laughs> love him. Awesome. Hey, so I see a bunch of people water. on here. Uh, so, hey, Chris. Hey, Mickey. Hey, Sheila. Hey, Lisa. I appreciate you guys being on here. I would love to know why you guys got in business. So, you know that Drew's financial control. I was just overall like control. I don't like rules. So, what was that thing for you um, that had you say, enough is enough, or I'm going to do something in addition to? The regular job um so i would love to see those and then also um let's talk about let's talk about um while we wait on those comments let's talk about money when you earn it so this is another idea that i want to um share with this uh teenager because i think it's so key so money how it's different when you earn it in a paycheck versus in a business. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That was a big one. Hold on. Sheila is freedom. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Go ahead. Paycheck versus business. All right. You can bust out the, uh, oh, I get more. the markers for this one. You guys, I'm sure all know this, but for a, a young teenager, this is a very important concept that I didn't pick up until I was in my 30s. Mm -hmm. So we all earn money, whether it's in a business or at a job, you earn, all right? So when you're comparing the pillar of money and how you receive it from a job to a business, first you earn it in both situations, okay? okay? Now, eventually, keep going, you just go, all right. Let's start with the job. So you earn it. Then what happens next? So you earn the money, that's your gross income, but we all know it's not your net. So there's going to be taxes. Okay, so you earn the money, then the money is taxed, and then you spend the money, right? It's the money you keep, it's your net. Earn, tax, spend, ETS, earn, tax, spend, earn, tax, spend. That's the sequence of events of how you get your money, high level. So hold on. So your earn is your gross income. So that's the total amount you earn. So if somebody says they make $3,000 a month and they are, their gross income is $3,000, then it's taxed. And let's say it's taxed. I'm just using a simple example, 10%. So that's 300. And let's just pretend there's no other fees or anything else you have to buy into or pay into. So you have 3000 minus your 300 for what's taxed. And now you, and that becomes your net income. So $2,700 then becomes your net income. Mm -hmm. And then you get to spend that money. Get to. Get to. Okay, <laughs> go ahead, keep going. So the fundamental difference, and I never really understood until being in business for a bit, that you reverse a couple of key components that make all of the difference. When you have a business, you still earn money up front, mm -hmm. but you get your paycheck first. So you essentially earn the money, which is still your gross, which is still your gross. And then you spend the money because yep. the business has expenses, just like a person or an individual has expenses. And then you're taxed on what's left on what's left. Okay. Hold on. So we're going to use my same example. So your gross is 3000. Let's say they're equal. 3,000, now you spend it on your business expenses. Let's say your business expenses are $2,000. And I'm just using, again, we're just using simple numbers right now. Let's pretend it's only $2,000. And then you're taxed on what's left. So 3,000 minus 2,000, that's 1,000. And then if we're using the same 10%, then that's $100. So over here, you're paying $300 in taxes. And here you're paying $100. And the numbers we're using are grossly underestimated. I say gross, I mean, this is kind of, ah. but um, the tax 
the taxes amount from your job is way higher than your 10%. It's way, way, way higher. And what you're going to spend on the business side is higher so that you actually get taxed a lot less than this. So even though this is showing a three X, it's actually a lot higher than that or of a, of a difference. That's excellent. So as you guys know, we are not CPAs or accountants or professionals in that regard. You got to go talk to your uh, professional that you pay for that sort of stuff. Um, but we are sharing what our experience has been for us yes. and everyone else's situation is different. But conceptually, that is a consistent setup that you can yeah. Google and is in the public knowledge domain. So we're not talking about anything that, that's so specific down a particular avenue, but it's a high level concept that like all the business owners know. I didn't know, I didn't recognize that no. that in and of itself gives you so much control. Once you really understand that, you will recognize the opportunities or begin to learn how to see better when it comes to opportunities to transition the type of expense. Maybe you have an expense that's legitimately your, your, you know, for your business. It just so happened before you were in business, you used it personally. So that business is convertible into a business expense. You know, most cases and all the rules about it being ordinary and necessary that you got to go by. But how powerful this is, you recognize, is we started investing in real estate when we both had jobs. Yeah. And so what you'll find is there are rules that lock some of the tax benefits that come with investing in real estate, right? And so when you're in that traditional vehicle, you can get locked out of a lot of those benefits. And it sucks because mm -hmm. you're carrying these paper losses that you can't really lower your tax bill with. But what you actually see is once you begin that process of migrating out of the Iron Maiden, what happens is you begin to unlock the secrets of the tax code and some of these other business benefits that you had been previously held uh, and barred from receiving. You didn't get access. You didn't qualify yeah. because you weren't really in the game business-wise. You were still, you know, on the corporate nipple, right? And that's just kind of how it's treated from a tax perspective. So it was so amazing to see that once we switched and we're all in business-wise, how much more favorable our tax structure became because we could now uh, experience the, um, the effects of those tax benefits firsthand as opposed to reading about them, hearing about them, seeing them, which is why generally that process starts when we go to talk to our family and friends, it's tough to talk about raising capital because even if, even if you can talk about how it's, it's less expensive money with mm -hmm. the interest that you pay them, you know, it's still income to them. And you know, kind of how that goes with the tax brackets, if they're a high, highly paid E quadrant, then there's still going to be that, that component where it's the dollars are taxed less than their wage dollars, their W2 dollars, but they're still piling on top. Yeah. which limits, you know, some of that. So um, the business and job combination, there are some unique things about how you get your money. And then there's the overlap when you're kind of one, one foot out the door and the other on a banana peel. And then once you transition, there is, there is some goods over in the promised land mm -hmm. if you can manage to successfully get there uh, over some time. So that's one thing that I think has been uh, just a side benefit that, um, makes what we just showed very real. When you earn the money, uh, you know, spend it for legitimate business expenses and have a much smaller amount at the end left for, to, to give away to the taxes, it's like you've, you've helped the, you've benefited the health of your business, right? You've invested in the health of your business, giving it what it needs and you're still paying your tax bill. So it's not like you're doing any harm in that regard. Um, you're just not overpaying. Because yeah. everybody knows your two busy, biggest expenses through the course of your life are debt, D-E-B-T, and taxes. So just by becoming a business owner, you get the opportunity to take a big slice or a big cut into one of the two, mm -hmm. which is a wealth principle in itself. Very nice. So uh, when we talk about expenses, let's take it out of just investing in real estate. And let's say, let's say you have a chef. <laughs> or somebody that wants to aspire to be a chef. And so you're going to run this business. And let's say um, you're going to run, maybe you're going to be a personal chef. So let's talk about some of the expenses that a personal chef would have that would be considered ordinary or necessary, or you can make a case for um, on your taxes. So what about groceries? Yeah, for a chef, mm -hmm. that would probably fall in the category of uh, 
a regular yeah they're yeah. chef and they're catering yeah so putting it on here right so if you earn over here if you earn three thousand and you need to spend a thousand on groceries you're not taxed on that part so then what about uh fancy knives we're just starting to get into cut goes. i should have told him i want more cut goes for my birthday i forgot i didn't do that i want more cut goes for my birthday <laughs> um so we're just getting into fancy knives, right? So would you consider fancy high-end knives a business, an ordinary and necessary business expense? Not for real estate investor, but for a Who chef. are we talking about? We're talking about a chef. I think for a chef, that's probably legit. It's so legit. What about uh, nice plates? Because you need to serve something very nice, yeah, right? Yeah, chef and catering business, certainly. Your, pa your pots, your pans, your all your equipment. What about a kitchen? What about needing a fancy kitchen, needing like high-end commercial kitchens. Oh, because you got to move to more of an online business and you need to produce high quality videos. At home and videos and all. In the world. So there is, your audience. there are so many things. And then you think, oh gosh, but I only make 3000. Well, obviously you need to be able to afford, you need to be able to actually physically pay for the things that you want to buy, but you're not going to be taxed on it. So the beautiful thing is that you can, you can increase your tax, you can increase your expenses that you can use for your business and have all the nice things um, and you don't have to pay taxes on it first you get to spend it first so I thought that was really I thought that was a cool thing yeah I don't know how many of you guys are readers but to kind of close out the tax topic unless you guys want to talk about taxes more I was just looking at my tax return <laughs> last night so this stuff is fresh on my mind and I'm just like wow I was telling Risha last night I said this this tax return presents such an amazing story in the it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. But I wasn't saying that five years ago. I was like, yeah, we're going to pay more. Yeah. Um, but uh, a lot of the principles we picked up in a book called Tax-Free Wealth. Uh, Tom Wilwright's the author. Um, he's part of one of the Rich Dad uh, Advisors, um, a pretty good uh, resource, very credible. Um, he was actually one of the first people uh, that I was looking to as far as the you know, big names on you yeah. know, how do you see the world from this you know 50,000 foot view with um, you know, some of the, the, the business um, actions that have been taken around the PPP and the different stimulus packages, like what that landscape look like, right? It, it's a big thing and a lot going out there as we come to see that that landscape is still changing. But uh, yeah, if you guys are big readers, Tax-Free Wealth um, was, was a pretty helpful one. I think I got my copy off Amazon um, for maybe 15 <laughs> bucks. Anyway. <laughs> Okay. Literally, I'm looking at my tax last, return. It's yeah. over there. You guys want to see And it? I can we'll see through. tax return wealth over there. Okay. So the last thing I want to say, hold on. This is a very important question. Oh, it is an important you. question and it's for you. Oh, and they can look at tax free wealth online. Do you okay. guys know how to use Amazon? I'm sure you do. But Better than Amazon. Ta -da! That's what it is. Yeah. Good it's one. a good book. It's a good book. Um, even if he made Drew not like pickles. What? <laughs> another story for another time so the question I have for you and for you guys because I think this will really really help so even if you're driving even if you're doing something um, else where you're multitasking if you can come back to this video and answer this question it would be um, in, I'm incredibly grateful for it so if you could take everything you know now about owning a business about being a business owner and you could rewind to six to being 16 years old what would you tell your 16 year old self about what steps they should take to move forward <laughs> or the bet maybe the best thing about being an investor or not an investor a business owner best thing about oh gosh when i was 16 years old i'm sorry i was bagging groceries at the local piggly wiggly down the street paper plastic <laughs> We need help to your cart with that. Does Safeway appreciate you calling them Piggly Wiggly? Four dollars and twenty-five cents an hour is what my wage was at sixteen years old. Uh, it wouldn't have taken much convincing. You would have probably said, if you want to control your financial future, then the best opportunity you have is to own a business. Um, the second piece of advice I would, I would I, so I would drop that as a knowledge nugget. And then so here myself, ask myself a question, well, how do I do that? Or so what should I do? I'd, I'd probably say something like, find something that if you're passionate about it and you can get paid on and there's oppor legitimate opportunity for that thing, go for that and uh, learn how to be an extrovert and 
be a hell of an extroverted marketer because guess what? If you want to have success in business, people got to know what the heck you're doing and you need to be able to make a lot of friends and uh, get the word out there. So um, those will be three pieces that I think would be big for me because it took me, A, to the first point, it took me a long time to even recognize that there was a way to make money outside of a job. I thought you had to be an actor or author or a sports celebrity. It was very limited. Everybody only had jobs. It's like the only way you can make money is this. Um, the second piece, as far as um, the idea about being passionate, I think that when I went into my education for training, I just picked the major and the occupation that I felt would pay me the most within the reasonable amount of sacrifice. Like that doesn't even sound sexy, but that's, that, mm -hmm. that's the truth. And then um, what I say for the, for the third one, um, the third one being an extroverted marketer, um, I found that um, that is such a key piece that there's a lot of misnomers about the value of marketing. Sometimes sales and marketing gets mixed up. People hate selling. They don't necessarily hate marketing, right? They, they don't like sleazy sales antics that convince and get you, right? That's, that's you know, a, a, like a shady salesman or something like that. But the idea of marketing can be a whole lot more desirable when done correctly. It's, it's no different when you get an ad that's like, oh, I don't like that. You're like, oh, I don't like that spam. But when you get a message, it's like, whoa, everybody's had an ad hit them where you not only wanted it as soon as you saw it, but then the ad made you want it more than where you had to have it. That's powerful. And if you're a serious business owner, you want to be able to make your thing sexy. Look, I've, I've, I've got a water bottle. It, look how it shines in the light and it's got a company name on it. It keeps your water so cold. Like just the simple the ideas <laughs> that it doesn't take, you know, much to be able to help, um, help people see the value in what you have. And uh, I think those are just three components that would have gone a long way because for me, it took multiple decades to even raise awareness to those things. And then to be start to work on them, what become a marketer, I'd rather calculate a Fourier transform. I know how to do that. Right. So uh, marketing put me in my com outside my comfort zone um, for somebody that's a little bit introverted, except for when I'm on these live calls um, going out to the marketplace is, is, is a lot different. So I would learn to build that skill earlier, no different than the Girl Scout cookies. That's probably one of the best training little kids can get is dealing with that rejection because you never know, you might find, you know, some 40 year old guy that can't pay the two bucks for the Girl Scout cookies and it's a life changing moment for them like it was for Jim Rome when he couldn't pay two bucks for the Girl yeah. Scout cookies and then he went on to become a multimillionaire. Anyway, <laughs> let me get a sip of drink. Water. You were saying? Um, okay, so if I were to answer the same question, if I were to go back to being 16 and having that same question with the knowledge I have now, um, I would say that the best thing I can do is find a teacher or find somebody else who's done what it is that I want to do. And it doesn't have to be in... Um, a very specific niche necessarily. Um, the closer the niche, the better, because then they already have paved the path a little bit. But find somebody who's already done what you want to do and follow them, regardless of what um, it feels like everybody else is saying. Remember what Drew says, you don't have to opt in to what others are doing. You don't have to opt in to what others are doing. You don't have to opt in to what the masses are doing. You don't have to opt in to the, the messages of, you need to go to school, you need to get a good job, get a degree to get a good job. Like you don't have to do it that way. And so recognize that your path is your path and choose that path intentionally. And the worst thing that can happen if you fail is you fall down and you have to get back up and start over. But if you continue to wake up, then your life is not over. So just keep going, keep going. Like. It's just that simple. so that would be what I have to say to myself. Um, and it's probably a good reminder to say it to myself uh, every day. Sure. Sure. Because in 10 years, we're going to say, what would you say to your 10 year younger self? You guys have probably seen that Matthew McConaughey speech where he talks about, oh my know, gosh. who's my hero. Oh my gosh. I should, we'll post that. It's, we'll post a link to that. Who's my hero. That's a good one. Um, I used to kind of think about this, but I never looked at it quite the same. And, and essentially what he talks about is his hero is himself 10 years in the future. And so when he gets there, it's like, well, who's your hero now? Didn't you arrive? It's like, no, it's still the future me. Mm -hmm. And so I used to have a little bit more abstract way to, to think of it. it 
um, I would sometimes when I was younger think about the future and say like, what do I want to have in the future? And um, I kind of referred to it in a sports analogy. It's like, if I want to set myself up for a future gain, it's kind of like throwing an alley-oop to myself in basketball. Your teammates running down there, whoop, and then you just boom for the alley-oop. Because you get the visual, right? The sound effects, I hope did it. But the idea is like, how can I throw myself more alley-oops? Because I wanted to be able to set myself up to win in the future. And sometimes it's a hard exercise to come up with. It's like, okay, well, then, you know, you need to, you know, I don't know. Out of the room. <laughs> I, I just stumped myself. I'm trying to think back when that question was running through my head. How can I throw my out self an alley oop? So it might be in, in the corporate realm, you know, uh, strategically sign up for that project to put you in the higher public eye, kind of that brown nosing type stuff. But it's like there's strategic smart moves to get you in the limelight that you can gain some seniority or some favor that might get you a raise or promotion, right? Um, how can I throw myself an alley oop? Um, how can you guys be throwing yourself an alley-oop right now? Um, you know, a lot of people have been, you know, sometimes feeling stuck. It's like, all right, as soon as businesses get open, you've seen the memes. They show these guys, all a bunch of buff dudes running around. It's like the first day when quarantine's over, it's like all these guys running through the doors. It's like, oh my gosh, the gym's going to be a madhouse. But like, we start thinking, okay, how can we continue to throw ourselves alley-oops? And, um, you know, when, when you think about the space that we're in, operate, operating in the real estate arena where, you know, there's all this crazy stuff going on, but then on what we're actually seeing on Main Street is that it's like, all right, it's not actually disastrous. In some places, sales prices are rising. So, you know, how can you be throwing yourself those alley-oops if you've, let's say, you know, pulled in the reins on your marketing budget, right? Um, you know, how can you be throwing yourself an alley-oop by setting up more free ways to market so you feel like you're still going and moving ahead? And so throwing yourself an alley-oop or looking to yourself to be your hero, yeah. right? Because if you're still trying to get your first wholesale deal done, what does the 10 year version of yourself look like? Have they done 10 deals in one a year? Have they done a hundred deals? But when you think of that person, then you start to map into the like, okay, if that's what I want to have, then you can logically back into what you need to do. And we all know the phrase be, do, have. It's easy to latch onto the have yeah. and not want to do. And then some of us will do the do. So it's okay. That's cool. But still it's a lot of do do if you will not be before you do. So you got to be, then do, then have, and that's just kind of the natural sequence of events, but we tend to want it in reverse. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I love it. <laughs> what? You know, like the doo-doo. I'm reference. laughing when you said doo-doo after you would be quick to snap at the children and say, stop saying doo-doo. We're not at the dinner table. Yeah. Okay, true. That's <laughs> the only time they don't get to say. So anyway. Um, do you guys have any other questions before we get off or comments? Um, all right. I love that you guys are joining us today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Like so a little bonus, a little bonus gift from Miss Risha today. Yes. Your yes, little yes, lecture yes. to love. Um, I guess I would say is kind of one, one of the closing thoughts is, um, you know, don't be shy when you guys are on it. If there's something that's been burning a hole in your brain, mm -hmm. um, you, know, you know, we're open up to answer anything about Black Book, but even, you know, business, other business topics too. Um, we can keep that forum open and kind of free flowing. Um, I, we found a lot of questions coming our way that do specifically have to deal with marketing. Yeah. Um, so we were thinking about if we should try to do um, more theme based lives. Uh, if you guys are planning to be on, this is a good time slot for everybody. A few people got on today. You know, next week we're going to be on at the same time. So if you guys have a vibrating frequency amongst you that we need to tune into uh, and make sure we're satisfying that craving, um, let us know. Let yeah. us know. Um, that'll help us out. Otherwise, we'll still stay cooking up some good stuff for you. But just to keep it relevant and high value, uh, we want to reach out and make sure we're uh, scratching you where it itches. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we're going to go <laughs> celebrate my birthday. And we love you guys. Thank you for joining. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Take it easy, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>